Thanks, Gary. That was great. Whew. That always gets me breathing. Wakes me up a little bit. Well, I noticed I was recording the whole thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're fine. Yeah, I forgot to turn it off at the beginning, but that's okay. The other, the other tip that I forgot to mention is that I always find this works better for me if I don't wear shoes, you know, when I really yeah. feel the, the energy, you know, from the earth. And if I wear shoes, it's like, you know, that can impede it. It's just strange. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just I, another weirdness, you know. Yeah, I wear Hey Dudes, and my wife was showing me uh, somebody in the airport. Look, they're wearing Hey Dudes, too. And I said, yeah, that doesn't make me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, Angelique, how are you doing? We're, uh, uh, and we got uh, Jose, and I don't know who else. Oh, Tim, and uh, let's see. Well, anyway, uh, what, uh, we're going to start out, you know, we were discussing the uh, projection uh, in the last uh, thing, but um, Angelique, you just uh, put your, uh, I mean, just uh, whatever you want to talk about. Uh, let's just take as much time as you need and can't wait to hear it. So, go ahead. Thank you. And, and thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, I hope I don't disappoint you because it all started with a very short, spontaneous kind of 10 minute presentation because you, Craig, suggested, you know, I teased you a little bit more with what I suggested. And then I realized, you know, it, it should have been, I now feel it should have been something more better researched. But anyway, I have been in transit this last week and I am in Greece. So <laughs> um, I, I hope it's, you know, um, Anyways, um, it all started by an excerpt from the Black Books on January the 5th, 1922, in which, in which Jung's soul advised him as follows. You should not break up a marriage, namely the marriage with me. No person should supplant me, least of all Tony. I want to rule alone. You must let Tony go until she has found herself and is no longer a, a burden to you. Um, so I was shaken by this because um, that was Jung's soul, after all, taking a stance in regards to his relationship. Um, in 1925, again in the Black Books, I also found Tony's part which was Tony's, Tony's point of view. And she was writing, what Carl has achieved now is all based on me. Through my faith, love, understanding and loyalty, I have kept him and brought him out. I was his mirror, as he told me right at the beginning, but my entire feeling, fantasy, mind, energy, responsibility to him. I have an effect but I don't have substance. I didn't know how to play in inverted commas. I gave him my life. Now he should give me mine and be a mirror to me. Um, that's Tony Wolf, the Black Books, volume one. Um, so I think all the thoughts started from, from that really, from these two so opposing uh, views of what, Jung Sol was saying, and um, now in a comment of the I Ching by James de Korn, mm -hmm. I found this. In Western myth, the dragon is usually an adversary which the hero must conquer before he can obtain a treasure or often a captive, maid, a captive maiden. But for the Chinese, the dragon has been from the earliest times a symbol of dignity, wisdom, sovereignty, and sagehood. Um, so, I, I would like to invite you to think of the projection as this dragon um, with this double sort of value on it. Um, and I would like to start by projection and, 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 and possession. Uh, in ancient Greece, possession by a god usually means loss 
of one's ability to distinguish the human from all other forms of life, like to distinguish the human from the animal or to distinguish the human from the plant. And I'll give three examples. Um, in the Iliad, Homer presents us with the temporary madness of Ajax, the Telamonius. So after Achilles' death, uh, Achilles' weapons should be, according to the tradition given to the most, uh, to the strongest and to the bravest of the heroes. And that was Ajax, the Telamonius. Instead, the Atreids give them to Paris. Ajax, in his anger, receives a temporary madness um, from the goddess Athena. And while thinking he slays the Atreids, he kills a number of animals in the field, but he has lost the ability to distinguish and he cannot see those are animals he slays, but actually he thinks he slays human beings. When Athens is presented to withdraw this, he actually sees that the, At the Atreids are perfect and he sees all the animal um, or the animal bodies he has laid. Um, another example is Lycurgus, the king of Th Thrace. Um, he did not accept Dionysus as God. And as a result, he is possessed by Dionysus' temporary madness. And while in it, he thinks he is destroying all the vines in his territory as a revenge to the god he does not believe in. Whereas actually he is dismembering his own son and in some versions of the myth, wife. Um, again, when he seems to come back and this projection is not there, it is only then that he can see the difference between um, the plants and the animals he has he has uh, killed. Um, and, and last but not least, in the back here, Agave and his sisters fail to recognize Dionysus' divinity. The god possesses them, and as a result, during again their temporary madness, she dismembers her own son by mistakenly taking him for a young animal, which she again tears apart. Tears apart. Uh, and it is in that example that her father Cadmus, like a therapist, talks her out of the possession until she is able to realize that in her hands, she is actually holding um, Penteo's head. Um, some researchers tell us that the hero archetype is an archetype relatively new in the history of man. They have ventured to prove that in matriarchal societies, in the more archaic of rituals and in the narrative of the oldest mysteries, like the mysteries of Eleusis, there is not a hero in the story. Any notion of evil, instead of being fought against, seems to be rather mated with and transformed, like the union between Hades and Persephone, which in the end leads to Persephone having enlarged her personality. She now is capable, as Hades tells her, to be the queen of both worlds. Um, in these earlier narratives, beasts are not slain. Guard, Gordian knots are not cut. These journeys seem rather journeys of humanness and relatedness in its full struggle and glory. The initiates in the mysteries are not transformed through heroic deeds, brave or majestic murderous acts. They are transformed through pain and suffering, trying to relate to the unrelatable. And for me, this is the question in a way, how do we relate to the unrelatable? Do we see it like the Sufis um, who tell us only in another person's heart you can truly see yourself and the presence of God within you? Or we look at it a bit like the existentialists, a, a bit like Sartre who said, my hell is others, where our obstacle to wholeness or God in our case, are actually the others. Um, 
In ancient Greece, if a stranger knocked on your door, you'd better let them in, welcome and feed and offer shelter to them. Open your heart and home. This is the famous Greek hospitality that we all know. But what is not very widely known is the reason behind it. The rationale in Italy was that the foreigner knocking at the door might be a god in disguise. Hence, the Greek hospitality, philoxenia, as we call it, was not an act of kindness as such, but rather an act of necessity, because no one wanted to mess up with a god, should they be the stranger. Um, this today would go against the idea of withdrawing the projection. It is actually an example where one is in, in a rather one is rather religiously and culturally instructed to hold on tight to a positive kind of projection for as long as the stranger's visit is to last. So, and we have myths in the ancient Greek lore in which the host and hostess either fail to do that and the stranger turns out to be a god and there come dear consequences in the form of a revenge of this god or there are also cases where the gods have been um, accepted really warmly and, and uh, truthfully and they reward um, uh, the, their, their hosts. So the question is do we find god through relatedness or aloneness? Um, and in this, it seems that researchers like Carol Christ seem to suggest that the sex that we ascribed to the divine um, might define our, our experience of it, and might also affect how we, we look at the path reaching it. Um, is it a female god and we reach it through eros, or a male god, more hero-like? and we reach it through Logos. Um, because if it is Eros, it seems to ask for ecstasy, intimacy and pleasure. It takes us to desire. But if it is Logos, there seems to ask for a relative sobriety, groundedness and aloneness. Hence the necessity to withdraw from this desire if the other is actually the obstacle and the confusion that might prevent us from reaching closer to the divine. So desire in its philosophical sense, is it a path or an obstacle? Um, in the Sufi tradition for Rumi, um, his life partner, Sams, is God. And that does not mean that Rumi is in a state of psychosis because he is well aware that Sams isn't God, but at the same time, it is a reflection of him. Um, in the Dionysian mysteries, that is the edgy, in my view, cutoff point that the initiate plays around with while they become initiated. Who is this other? Is this, is it myself? Uh, is it God or the goddess? Is it the other or all three together? for Pentheus seems to meet his destructive self in Dionysus. But the Bacchae, not the Menets who are possessed by the God, but the Bacchae who are in true pure ecstasies, they seem to meet their ultimate ecstatic truth and essence in Dionysus. Um, and I'll talk a bit and I'll finish um, on erotic projection. Uh, the, the I think it's more questions than answers because I don't think there are answers, but um, on the erotic projection, um, the desire for relatedness seems to be at the heart of the feminine principle. For Eric Schwartz, a philosopher, desire is a string stretched between two complements and the sound of this string is life. To produce a sound, you need a shock to make it vibrate. And this shock is eroticism. He continues, compliments are always two extreme aspects of one and the same thing, sensation or emotion. The shock results from a disequilibrium in this state of tension. Uh, 
The disequilibrium literally produces an oscillation between the two complements, a movement that results in the exaltation of life, and the effect of this is originally expressed in sexual arousal. So this terrible and magnificent archetype, in my view, is Aphrodite, and it is she who sets little and fragile psyche, all these cruel, sometimes merciless, often impossible looking tasks that she, that will cause her to transform from a puella, as von Franz would say, to a mature woman capable to love a god. As Gustave Lambert showed in Madame de Bovary and Pierre Laclos in Liaison Dangereuse, Desire as projection can lead a man or woman to their destruction. And I think Euripides in Bacche shows exactly the same. Dionysus is depicted using um, Pentheus' great desire to watch the Bacche. And this, is, this becomes his great unrecognized desire, unconscious deep desire, seems to become the path that drags him uh, to be dressed as a man, which is actually the beginning of his end. Um, this seems to happen when this divine sacred energy is stripped by its sacredness and becomes projected rather literally on a human being. And I think we are getting into the heart of the reason, my feeling is, of the breaking up between Jung and Freud which resulted in Hugh's journey. Um, Sabina Spielrein wrote uh, this article on the energy that constantly transforms. And it seems that the essence and aim of this energy is to constantly transform no matter the cost and no matter the poor little mortals. So these mortals who in their hubris caused by arrogance, come to have the illusion that they become the sacred energy, seem to just become the hosts, the temporary hosts of it. Um, so when we fall in love, we tend to think we become Aphrodite herself. And then in ancient Greek, literature identifying with an archetype, it means being fully possessed by an archetype. So an inflated position for a humble mortal is, is like, has the result to be carried away by the power of, of Aphrodite. I think uh, Sappho's poems show, talk quite a bit about that. Um, so erotic projection seems to make sure we feel as divine as the goddess. And then the object of this desire looks also wrapped in this divine light themselves. Uh, so there is this illusion that two almost godly humans are to meet. And the problems, if we look at ancient Greek tragedies, seem to start from the lack of recognition that the mortals become the carriers of this divine power and not the owners. So, because this divine feminine energy carries inherently the capacity to transform itself, only as a small secondary minor effect, it also manages to transform us. Uh, in biology, we have this phenomenon and or, when an organism needs to reproduce, they find another organism with which they invade. The secondary organism becomes temporarily the host of the first. The occupied organism is the xenistis, the term we use in biology, because it offers its own cells for the other organism in order to reproduce. Upon successful reproduction, the first organism will leave the Xenistis simply because its biological destiny will have been fulfilled. So we humans seem to become the temporary Xenistis of the sacred feminine's amazing magic for short periods in our life where she seems to inhabit us in the form of love. 
and tragedy can only hit when from humble temporary hosts, we think we become the masters of the energy, as Sabina Spielrein seems to say. And exactly what Jung has said when he says man tends to think he is the master in his own home, but this is not at all the case. Um, I think I'll finish. The last thing I'll say. Um, so it's in all in all Greek tragedies, uh, confusing the boundaries between human and divine seems to lead to disaster. And human love can be an example of that. But what I tried to say in these few minutes I talked last time was that the invitation from the gods I feel is real. And I feel that it is that the object it latches on is not. So as long as the invitation and the calling, say from Aphrodite or Dionysus is being examined for its sacred message to our soul, uh, it is okay to withdraw the projection. So what I'm trying to say in the end, and I hope I didn't give, it, give you a headache, is really, it's fine to withdraw the projection, but it's not okay to withdraw the message coming from the projection because that would be a hubris. That would be denying access of a God to your home. We are doomed to become the hosts, the xenistes of gods. <laughs> now, the, the hard task, as Jung said, is this awful negotiation he's doing in the black books and in the red book. How do you host something bigger than you? How do be, you become the Xenistis of something that is so much, much bigger and has created you without being dissolved, without being dismembered or being dismembered temporarily in order to become whole again in this contraction of the universe as part of this contraction of the universe. Um, so as long as the messenger is not confused with the message, as long as by withdrawing the projection, we do not lose the calling from the divine feminine, it is all fine. Um, because the desire for projection, um, the desire, sorry, for connection should not be withdrawn in my view, as the projection should. Um, so that the god or goddess who carried it simply can also be heard. So thank you. A Angelique, I just believe I'm standing on a precipice, you know, looking into, you, you know, the uh, several hundred thousand year history of people being born and dying and living their lives. And the message of these projections are so, rich and vast and yet this little uh thin surface of ego is witnessing all this and where did it all come from and how did it all get uh recorded you know this uh, wonderful story of the greek myths and things the message of the projections you know they they came from nowhere else but as you know strangers knocking on the door of ego consciousness, you know, and revealing themselves to us. Another uh, wonderful example you use as, uh, as, as in, in sexual reproduction, the host uh, is invaded, you know, by another uh, uh, being, these messages. And, and you know, I'm, I'm in, in, in these fairy tales and in these myths, what we're really um, seeing is an X-ray of, uh, of the energies that um, created our, us, because they, we are the only conduit of the manifestation of these stories and these myths, which so are far exceed the capacities of uh, this, you know, little surface uh, mass of thoughts we had. 
So, you, you know, that's, that's the, the really, the wonderful question is, is the level of the projection. I mean, what level are we operating at? You know, now, when there is a projection that possesses us, and you gave so many wonderful examples of it, it is, um, you know, trying to force us into the reality of the inner world the energies that shaped our bodies. And then you gave the wonderful example, do we find God in the, in the darkness, in the, in the dialogue with the depths, or do we find it in another human being? You know? But I think it's, it's all, you know, it, it's, there, there is no separateness in it. I mean, this is the idea. I think it's all one field. I mean, a Angelique, I've just that was just sort of my wandering. What what do you um, do? You have any? What do you think about that? I mean, everybody can ask. That's my question. <laughs> I don't know if it's a question. Two things. If we if we had more time, there is this expert. Uh, there's this passage from I and Thou, Martin Buber. I yes. think that would be the one to finish this kind of um, thing. But. Another thing is we don't know much truly about uh, about projection because do you know the story of of Jung and Tony Wolf about the mosaics of Ravenna? Mosaics of Ravenna, where they go down to uh, see these mosaics which haven't existed for hundreds of years, and yet both of them saw them at the same time. They go there, Tony and. And, and young, they see together these mosaics, which were destroyed hundreds of years ago, they come back and they ask their friend to send them pictures of them. And they say, well, those have, those were destroyed several hundred years ago. But uh, what, what do you think about it, Angelique? I think that again, they share, they have a shared projection and that becomes their lived experience. So the capacity of the projection is something we have not yet researched. We cannot fathom as yet what projection is. We have we can look at it as a form of as a past madness in ancient in the ancient Greek literature. We have looked at it as a form of falling in love. But yet there are other aspects of projection of more than one. Because in this in this story of the mosaics of Ravenna, it seems that because Tony Wolf says, I saw them, it was not just you. We talked looking at these four amazing mosaics. One of them was Lapi Lapis Lazuli. And they, they were they were shaken by the beauty and the symbolism of them. Um, so they had a shared projection. It was a numerous experience, but then nobody else could confirm it. Um, but it had an effect on them and it was a shared projection. So it is interesting for me to think what would a projection means to a tribe, which is another level. What does it mean when you ask to dream for your tribe as a shaman, which is again another level of being with, um, being for, like dreaming for your group, dreaming for your people. Um, you are you carry these things through the projection. So I, I think again, we need to be very careful of the part that we withdraw, but then we need to be almost gods in trying to hold both the withdrawal as well as observing the useful things that the, the projection has come to the grace of the projection, if you like, the deeper, the deeper essence of it as the visit of a God. While at the same time for our safety, we need to make sure we, we withdraw, which is a, a Heraclean task. <laughs> it's not an easy thing, observing what the projection is trying to do to you from, from the gods, <laughs> while withdrawing it safely to make sure you are not slaying dragons that are not there or falling in love with uh, the god Eros instead of a man or a woman. Um, it's a Herculean task. It's, it's huge 
to be asked. <laughs> but then it's a bet, you know. And, and it's just, yeah, uh, I would just, one little comment is, it's just, everybody, uh, you, you know, the, the way, Angelique, the way you presented this is in a way that I've never considered it before, is, is the incredible profundity of all of these images, uh, you, you know, uh, drawing us in with this invitation of a, a projection is 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 sort of an a, a, uh, a, a something inside of us that when it sees this object that activates the projection, it uh, suddenly uh, it creates a great energy flow towards the object uh, that has awakened the projection projection, and there the the profound nature of the these. Um, the myths and uh, the fairy tales and the dreams that, and the outer beings who have no idea that they are projections. Awakening this, uh, uh, it, it, it's just the vastness of, of, the, of what you call the messages and the content. It includes all of this uh, absolutely stupefying myths, fairy tales, dreams, Music, art, uh, you know, uh, that, that has, uh, you know, existed through all the history. I mean, it, it, you know, one, one thing that is, is really interesting to me is, uh, you, you know, um, it's just from this fairy tale, you know, Baba Yaga is Hecate, you know, and Va Vasilisa is uh, Persephone, you know, and the reason she has so many bones around her because she's the great mother. And, and she, uh, you, you know, all, every person who's ever lived, who has added that little uh, uh, bit to the storehouse of the collective unconscious, it, 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 it possesses all the billions of lives, the hundreds of thousands of years, in this collective unconscious, which is available to us like that. You know, either in re reporting or through a dream. You know, uh, I mean, just the level you brought this, Angelique, is, is just amazing. Well, let's just go around the room and, you know, we, we can, we'll devote the whole session to this discussion. If you, let's see, uh, Gary, or just, why don't you uh, just go around the room and ask, uh, see if anybody yeah. has any comments. I guess it's, I was it's gonna mind make a... A quick comment. I mean, you know, it seems like the, the you know, the, the real problem is that we need to see the symbolic and instead we decide to objectify it and turn it into, you know, an actual form, which is, you know, actually just a projection of something inside of us instead of looking for, for you know, the symbol that's, that's hidden there. Would, would you say that's true? I think as therapists, but that that it's my subjective understanding. I would say that I think that yes, and I think that as therapists, we need to help the client carry this projection to its very end, um, and and in a way help them severe the last bit. Uh, you know the the identification with the object the crazy identification with the human object. But up to it, we have, in my view, we have, um, we need to help them carry, do all the way through to examine, um, because it carries very useful information for them, for their soul. It is, ex on the projection, we can read their soul's aspirations, like Jung, Jung Sol talked to him in the Black Book. We can read what it is trying to tell them up until it reaches, up until it latches on the object, up until it reaches the other human being, because all of it is theirs. It, it comes from a godly realm. It, it comes to tell things to them. So you cannot just severe the whole thing and throw it in the garbage. You need to keep it godly, as you say. 
and symbolic to its highest meaning up until it reaches the other person. And then I feel that we need also to help them look at the other person as a human being. So take all the godly qualities the projection carries for that human being that is desired. Because the projection ma makes this human being to become godly in the face of love. But we don't have to be love's executioners, like Yalom says. Because there is true love coming from the God realm for the client. And it, it is important that we open up the way for them to receive it. There is actual love taking place, but it's not with the object that they feel they receive it from. It comes from godly realms. And it's nice if they can share it with the living person. It's lovely. But it must not exhaust itself in the living person because they need to be able to be open enough and soft enough and open-hearted to receive the meaning that comes from the gods rather than the person. So it doesn't, it is not start and it doesn't end with the person, but the person has been the catalyst. Again, in chemistry, the catalyst is not enough to do the chemical reaction, but it's decisive upon the meeting of all the necessary ingredients. So that's the idea. Without the catalyst, some reactions in chemistry never take place. But the catalyst is not one of the main ingredients. It's an added thing. So I agree with what you say, yes. It's well, be I'll, careful right. not to. Yeah. I'll go around uh, unless someone's got a question they want to I just wanted now. to just say one word. What, what just came to my mind is, that that uh, that that the the message of the projection is divine. The the but the the uh, uh, making it uh, literal or concrete has a demonic quality. I mean, it, there's a, there's an aspect of that that becomes demonic. But but all of the messages of every projection we have of every person that we've ever been attracted to there is a divine message there but is uh, I, I this mystery of uh you know uh, of drawing us into outer life or drawing us into inner life you know is is uh uh it's just a wonderful mystery and uh you, you know sometimes is the projection uh uh meant for that other individual or is it meant for your own individuation you know i don't know a angelique what do you think when the object of the projection uh that that gives you the message of the divine is <laughs> is is one that does not want you you know or something well i i think that um i don't have enough experience but my my, my humble experience is that when Aphrodite say, let's speak on the erotic projection because it is easier. It's always the most intense and very luminous. But when Aphrodite visits, we say, me and the other, we are both, we both receive her grace. We both become luminous and a little bit numinous. We receive this numinous quality the other sees in us because we receive the goddess's grace. And the thing is that it, that won't last. And when it will finish, and this energy will move on, as uh, Sabina Spindrine says, to go and transform through another Xenistis, we will be left very human and very poor of light, <laughs> blaming each other for not really, um, you know, for not being as luminous as we thought we were. But, you know, we share a common grace. Um, that's my view. Um, nobody can stay a god forever, <laughs> but we can bathe in the light of gods. And we do temporarily. And that is marvelous. <laughs> you know, when we... 
Yeah, it's just a very strange interplay of our our you, you know this thin veneer surface of our ego consciousness with this vast divine uh, uh, messages of the projections, which who are they? You know, this idea, I'm not the master in my own house. Well, it, our own home is this vastness of, of the collective unconscious of, of, of not only of all the lives that have ever lived, but also the wisdom that, that brought gave them two hands, two legs, a head, and, and this consciousness. And by the way, is sending them, where else do these uh, images come from, these fast images? And all of these uh, messages of the projections are, are also a, a factor in our becoming um, the, uh, our flowering you know, our individual flowering, not as this thin veneer of ego consciousness, but as something altogether different and specific and, and separate from the general uh, herd, you know, of uh, just uh, of, the lit of, of literally being alive. It's, it's, it's a whole nother uh, level. I mean, it's just, well, go ahead, Gary. I'm... Yeah, you know, hey, I Gary, guess just... Oh, yeah, go ahead, Tim. Yeah, this is, gosh, this is really great, Angelique. Um, I've been working in this field for many, many years, and um, I'm just absolutely fascinated with the whole process, but I've never heard anybody describe it quite like you did. And there's a couple of things that really stand out for me. One is it's okay to withdraw the projection, but not the message of the projection. And that that helps solidify some of the difficulty I've had with uh, just being able to identify the energy that is flowing between these really positive energetic elements. So it seems to me that all of a sudden I'm thinking about, um, I think about this work in terms of alchemy, in terms of the, the opposites and the tension between the opposites. And now suddenly I'm thinking of the, the partner, the other, as also being a tension between opposites, bet between the object and the divinity. And that they, and that my responsibility in relationship to them is to make sure that I keep a balance between those, those two elements so that the energy persists. Um, and it seems to me that the same thing happens in reverse. So if someone's projecting on me and I can feel the energy that they're dealing with, it's, it's helpful for me to try to both separate the divine from the object in myself or the divine from my own ego. And also to be able to encourage their witness of this magical thing that happens in the relationship. So as a, you know, as a Christian, um, we, we often say we, we see the Christ in the other person. And I think that's talking about the same thing, that, that there is this projection of the divine and that is real just like the person is a real animal on the earth, but that where the, where the um, transformation happens is in the tension between those, those two visions of the same thing. So I project onto another person, I see the divinity, and I wanna make sure that I never associate either the, the person with the animal that they are on the earth or that associating them with the divinity that they channel. So trying to keep I, that, that balance. 
I love what you say, Tim, and I think what you described last time was very much within this context. And since you speak on the, about the Christian lore, I think the image that comes to me is this description of the walk to Emmaus. So many paintings depict that, where two friends discuss about him. And it's they bring his presence alive because two friends, they have met and they walk to Emmaus discussing about him. So this is what you described holding, for me, this is the feeling I get, these lovely paintings. I wish I had one ready to show you. There are many of different painters where the two friends, I think Jesus has been, has, is gone now. Yeah. But these two discuss in nostalgia about him. So they bring, they make him alive. Yeah, here we say walk to Emmaus. The same, yeah. So sorry for my pronunciation. Well, that's that's, that's probably the local pronunciation is probably accurate. <laughs> mm -hmm. But but I think that's absolutely right. That that we're all astonished in some degree uh, about how the divine manifests on Earth, and so we talk to each other. How does it how does it work for you? How does it work for you? And I think we're religion as a whole falls down is when some community or some leader says, well, this is how it happens. And they define the limits of numinosity. And everybody else, if they don't, if they don't subscribe to that particular uh, numinosity, they, they don't matter or they are wrong or something. It's really hard for us human beings to keep those that option open, that each of us has our own way of being numinous and of being made numinous by some uh, catalyst, as you say. And I love what you say because then it depends on the cultivated capacity each of the two presents themselves with in the meeting because that makes the meeting all more sacred. It's two mortals, but they meet in a sacred meeting the way Martin Buber presents it. Because the larger the capacity I have managed for myself, for the otherness of you, and the larger the capacity you have managed for yourself, for the otherness of me, the more of this Christ we can make present through our meeting. Exactly. Thank you very much, Tim. Sure, do you, you want to go next? Don't forget to unmute. I have one question to both of you. Talking about numinosity, to which extent it's better to call numen as an object as a target for the inner luminosity or predisposition somehow, and to which extent we can consider the relations with the Newman as a Newman object type of relation, an object type of relation. I mean, what in other language, religious language, are called the, the subjects of devotion, can be very helpful in popular religiousness. Uh, more, say, telluric, that Uranic type of approaches to religion using Mircea Eliade's approach. For instance, in the south of Spain or, or Italy, people are particularly devout to a given image of a, of a virgin or a specific manifestation of saying something. Uh, normally, this type of thing is ignored as, uh, say, lesser things from lesser beings, so to speak. But if that happens, there may be some reason behind it. You need some sort of tangibility. You, it's very childish. In, in Freudian terms, you have to grasp the object in use and luminosity somehow. Could you elaborate along those lines or discuss or shut me up as a lesser being from, with lesser ideas? 
I am not sure I will I will address I will I'm not sure I understand but I will try and answer and please let me know if I have understood what you are saying but are you are you saying that as humans we feel the need to have something tangible to hold on to in order to is this reward the thing you know, uh, I'll begin, you have to be a child to go to the heaven's kingdom. That's a constant uh, in many texts. Now, maybe a crude, rude uh, truth in it, you have to behave like a child, and child want to grab things. The first relation, uh, human relation, Freudian, not even Jungian, is to grasp, to, to touch the mother, things like that. And uh, to feel luminosity, perhaps you have to do some sort of inner regression and to be childlike. And then I elaborate that maybe some objectuality. I mean, uh, numens as, as objects to something that you have to relate almost in physical terms at some point. You do. Now, in erotic, uh, you, transference, in erotic yeah. transference, you do. Yeah. So looking at from an adult, self-centered and involved in meditation like many other people here, the temptation and even a class temptation is to look at that as underdeveloped uh, childish uh, things from lesser beings somehow or lesser stages of development. Unless we look at that in a dynamic thing that at some point you have to walk backwards to be able to open to that. To, if that can be done healthy or not, if some sort of people, those industrial business with this inclination, that's another matter, not to ignore, not to be distracted as well. I am not uh, crazy about, say, clergy, generally speaking, hmm? of any denomination, but that's a different discussion. But some people make business out of that. That, that's to highlight that there may be some significant dimension here. Uh, uh, Craig, would you like, Craig, you would you like to... Well, yeah, I would just say, yeah, that I, the, the idea, I think, is, is still... Um, I, I mean, I, I, I really think that the... Uh, are you saying, uh, Jordy, that um, the, uh, I mean, and the idea is that the message of the projection is, uh, is just one that is, is completely exceeds the consciousness of, uh, of a literal, our literal ego consciousness. And yet um, it is that aspect of us that is transformational uh, to uh, uh, allow us to transform into uh, 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 someone who can participate in this um, uh, message of the projection uh, in some way. I mean, we can't possibly encompass the whole, you know, but at least um, it, it is something that um, has, has moved uh, what we consider the the uh, ultimate truth to some other uh, other place other than our own literal egoness or something I don't know it is uh, uh, I, I I don't know I'm just saying um, I'm not sure uh, uh, I will I, I don't think I can um, answer straightforward. But I will give you a myth um, in which it's one of the most archaic ones where um, Hades have united with Persephone and their son is little young baby Dionysus and the Titans take this um, little baby 
and they dismember it. They allure it with toys and they dismember it into pieces. Um, Athena saves his heart, which uh, Zeus swallows and gives birth to it again through the union with Semele, a mortal woman. So this is the reason why we call Dionysus the twice born. He is born twice. Um, and, and the story goes that we humans are made by the conjunction of these two diverse natures, the Titan nature, which is very violent, uh, boisterous, um, animal, more, more wildlike, and, and the Dionysian one, which is the ecstatic, ec stance, you know, the ecstatic one. And we are a mixture of those two. In, 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 in Jung's, um, in, in, in Jung's idea, the divine, in you, if you go through Jung's red book on what happens to the divine child, the divine child in dreams reaches a point where it is almost dismembered, similar to Dionysus. So there is my reading, of course, who am I to say, but my humble reading is that the child is, needs to be sacrificed for the authentic child in us. The child is, is an aspect of the ego consciousness. The, the, the child, the, the divine child is a different kind of thing. Um, this is reflected in the Abraham uh, story. And perhaps, you know, um, I wish I was more, I was more well-versed in this to answer. I, I don't think I, I, I am as, I am not, I should have read more of the answer to Job. Or that I, I feel. I think the most startling thing, uh, the, the the real revelation to me uh, from what you you presented, Angeli. I mean, which is just as obvious. It should have been completely obvious to everyone, but it wasn't obvious to me. <laughs> is that the projection that awakens us, like uh, it awakens the Kundalini in the various chakras? You know, it, this energy that is awakened in us by something we're presented with, you know, in it, through our eyes and through our senses, and it awakens within us this, um, uh, a, it, it is, is um, you, know, you know, the word numinous means to, it's to call, to beckon us, you know? And so all of these projections that are beckoning, beckoning are literal, ego to participate in a reality the reality the wonderful uh vast uh full of of images and and narratives and uh stories uh, reality which, which is is really the wisdom that produce bodies is trying to flesh out who it is with all of these wonderful myths and uh, things. And they are trying to say, you are that too. You are all of these things, you know? And like the, this fairy tale of, of Vasilisa the beautiful is really the story of one woman uh, uniting with this divine realm, you know? And it, it, so all of the characters in it are really within her as an individual being. So, I mean, this, this is uh, what was the real revelation to me of, of this. Uh, what le the level the projection is operating at, the message of the projection is, is, is trying to tell us you are that, but don't take it literally. You know, that you, uh, you need, there's this aspect of the balance, you know, don't become uh, don't become attached to do it because then you become uh, a twisted demon, you know? I mean, it doesn't open you up it, unless you can withdraw the protection but keep the message. And the message is, uh, um, it is, is like the most beautiful passages in Mozart or the most beautiful art 
or uh, the most beautiful love affair or, uh, uh, and, and the vast history of, of human life on earth, you know, and you are that, all of that. There is, where did it come from if it didn't come from individual lives of human beings, you know? But anyway, let's keep, uh, it, let's hear something from everybody. Uh, I mean, it's just uh, so Yeah, we can either go around or someone can raise their hand if they've got uh, something they'd like to say. And that, I think it's good to go around to force people to tell us what they think. <laughs> First of all, thank you so much, Angelique. I think this is absolutely wonderful. It's so, so brilliant and, 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 and enriching. And I was also going to ask about, I actually feel that you often see that on a very practical level, this, this human sacrifice, this child that is sacrificed. Certainly as a therapist, um, you see often if you get clients who have gone through the AA cycle, all of that, in my eyes, they expressed stories of human sacrifice and being reborn again. And I was also going to ask about the divine child. I would link that in with the second birth of Dionysus. I don't know if that's true, but I would imagine it. And uh, and I, I have this question is that how can mortals stay in that energy with the divine a godly message and not be burned by it because some people apparently can stay in it forever and and they and they are able but very few and um most people as sabina spielrein also says it it moves on it moves on and um so i'm like on a body level it's very hard to carry that off that divine madness on a body level you know we we don't survive that on a body level i think for years and years but i just just a question or or do we have to be priestesses or how, how do you see that um i think that jung has has sort of showed the path by jung never fought ego consciousness he was looking, my understanding is he was looking to strengthen it in his clients and strengthen it and create the sacred space for this strengthening and only and wait for the dreams to lead the way. And only when the dream knew that the ego consciousness was strong enough, it would allow, it, the dream allows part of the world soul to pour a little bit in and only the dream knows how much so that it is not destroyed. This is depicted in the Dionysus myth with his mother Semele because the story goes that Zeus fell in love with Semele and when he went to meet her, Hera, his wife, said to her, oh why don't you ask him to show himself in all his full godly glory? So Semeli, Naib Semeli said, oh, yes, please, I want to see you. And he's pure light and pure fire. You know, he's, he's the lightning, Zeus. And when she saw him, she was burned into her asses. So <laughs> back he started with this image of her grave full of, um, uh, you know, plants. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Marina, I thought you uh, had your hand up. The ego consciousness. Um, and wait, because then it is a matter of grace of when the unconscious will honor us with a glimpse. But one, uh, this is the whole way that we talked with Greg last time. If we want it prematurely, might burn us if we go and take ayahuasca in the amazonian as, you know as sometimes we get clients and then we have a horrible experience or a mental disorder breakdown then it means that the ego consciousness was not strong enough to meet so as jung says one needs first to help differentiate ego consciousness Yes. from the collective unconscious and only when this separation has taken place a dialogue can start of the small with the big 
with a huge and only the dream knows. So what way? Because we don't step into this wisdom, the process, it's an alchemical process, as Gary said, it, it, it carries wisdom on its own and knows only it knows the timing. We do not. Yeah. We're just, we are humble workers and we work by strengthening the body while yeah. we strengthen ego consciousness. So that's our work, that's our task. And then the unconscious decides, you know, Yes, thank you. Beautiful. Hi. Thank you, Angelique. That was lovely. Very deep. I was um, thinking about several things, really. And um, one of the things that came to mind was um, there is a biblical quote about entertaining angels or entertaining strangers. So you can be entertaining angels unawares. So, so that's maybe replicated through many um, uh, cultures and religions and civilizations, possibly, you know. Um, and, and the other thing I was thinking about was um, the projection and, you know, where it comes from. And if it is a message, if it's a numinous message or a message from the gods, then it, um, you said it, it needs to be heeded. And the task is to, I suppose one of the tasks of therapy is to find the purpose. And that's not always easy <laughs> as we live in the earthly world and the temporal time. And so the manifestation of the projection can be, um, demonic as craig said there's just having an awareness really that and sometimes it can come in the form of an enchantment i like falling in love yeah and i guess in terms of withdrawing the projection again it's something about the therapeutic task is to very gradually withdraw the projection so that it's not removed but i like to think of it as being integrated and so going back to whence it came from, from within, from deep within. Um, yeah, but I suppose that they were my thoughts, really. It's about integration. You know, it was just a wonderful example of, the, of Tony Wolf, where his soul tells him that you can only be married to me, you know? And then, uh, it, Angelique, was that 1925 reference, was that from Tony herself, uh, that uh, where she was talking uh, herself about her relationship with Young? Or where, where did the 1925 reference come? That came from the Black Books too, or was it in the notes? I wonder, we might have lost her. She might have got a bad connection. I don't oh, okay. actually see her. All right. Well, yeah, you know, the one other thing I, I wanted to... Oh, she's back. She's back. Okay. I'm sorry. I just... Sorry. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Sorry, Angelique. You... Uh, yeah. Well, well, one thing I was going to ask you, Angelique, based on what Marina was just saying is, uh, if you're there was uh um you know that uh the wonderful uh, image that you did where the first young soul tells him that uh, tony uh, you can't be married to me and tony wall you know who is your soul or mystica is it me or is it tony wall and then that that 1925 uh reference you had i i had sort of the uh, was that from tony herself uh, uh, some a uh, message of tony that she wrote somewhere? I think so. It seems um, to be, I have to say, I'm sorry, Marina, because my internet let me down. Yeah. I am in place. Um, so I am not sure. I haven't yeah. heard your second question. So um, please feel free to say again. Yeah, I'm not sure that there was a question really. It's just um, thoughts that were resonating with me um, in response to um, your lovely presentation around 
that essentially the projection is an external manifestation of something deep within and it has a numinous quality and that the task of therapy is to gradually reintegrate it so that it you know withdrawing has a sort of speed like and um unthinking way about it but it to integrate it, um, it is not to lose its um, its 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 value and it, it, its expansiveness, and so, that, so that in reintegrating it, you can amplify it and explore it. And of course, there'll be so many levels and so many meanings. Yeah. Yes. That's, I yeah. think that the alchemical the alchemical dictum solve and quadula, Jung has has left us is important here because again you differentiate you help your client separate between the godly aspect of what's happening and the very literal as Gary said and the more you help differentiate this either within you or in your work then the more possibility of a potential union is there for you the, the, the ego consciousness is is strengthened because of its differentiation in the first place Jung tells us from the collective unconscious only the moment we start differentiating from the collective unconscious which is very painful which comes with a lot of sorrow and suffering only then we start creating the first hopes for getting in dialogue with it um, um, and it's similar, I think, with this. I feel for this idea I came up today that that um, the more we start differentiating who is the other as a human being, try struggling to see the other through all this, but also see the divine's workings through all this, what they are trying to transform, what is happening through us why we became the Xenistis of all this, why we felt all this amazing love and sensual happiness and uh, intimacy and now nothing. <laughs> why now nothing? You know, why we felt like godly creatures in front of another godly creature and now nothing. Um, so solving Quadula. <laughs> um, separate and then reunite again through meaning. Mm. Let's make sure we hear from Diane and Ava and Kat and Azim. Oh, yeah, we've got a lot. You know, I just thought I'd, yeah. what, you know, if people had something they wanted to say, I'd, I'd, so does any, either someone raise their hand or I'll call. Uh, yeah, I would just, let's, Aline, right. yeah, let's Aline, go in order we'll so go everybody ahead. can see. Aline, something. go ahead. Well, the richness, the richness here of this people's synthesis of their reading and learning and imaginations are just bowling me over you know Angelique that was the most wonderful presentation and uh it really expanded my mind you know and you were talking about ayahuasca and um alcoholics uh in recovery and um they're being reborn and reduced to ashes and hitting bottom and all of this resonated so much with the Vasilisa discussion by von Franz that was just that's my favorite chapter those last three chapters are my favorite I just find each rereading that I get um, an amazing. And so, Angelique, I, I thought the first thing I kept thinking was that you had sifted the poppy seeds really well. Mm -hmm. Yes, from the dirt. Yes, you did. <laughs> you did a fantastic job. That's interesting what you say about the poppy seeds, because in the Eleusinian mysteries, they were very important. Yes, they put, um, did the homework get put to sleep with poppy seeds? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, poor thing. <laughs> it, yeah. It's the wonderful uh, uh, differentiation of, 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 of the feminine principle uh, is to, to take things individually, the, the, not this, that. You know, right. I mean, it, where, where the, the male differentiation is so far away from the particular. And, uh, you, you know, I see this in my wife all the time when she's working with 
women in AA, every single event of their lives needs to be gone over like poppy seeds, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that's part of the, uh, of the, of the healing for, for her. This, the feminine uh, wisdom in that Vasilisa the beautiful is just wonderful. Yes, I agree. I agree. And um, yeah, I, the different, the differentiation she made between daughters and mothers in the book as well. I don't know if it, gosh, that, cause I have two daughters and I'm sure there's a lot of my projection gone on to them and vice versa. I can really see it um, now that I'm old and I have too much knowledge, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, and Baba Yaga is a therapist. She's uh, a, an al alchemist. She, she rides around in a pestle, a uh, mortar uh, with a pestle to steer her. And then she has a broom behind her where she sweeps all away all traces of her, of her tracks. I mean, that is, <laughs> that is uh, where, where, and what she does is she uh, uh, forces us into contrition, you know, in, into uh, the deepest remorse. But, uh, Anyway, yeah, I, that's why I say the level of, of this, uh, of, of the projection where Angelique took us is just, I'll never forget this. We, oh, do you have a comment? Gary? Oh yeah, go ahead, Diana. I'd like to go ahead and um, share because I'm in transition between you saying Galveston in transition and retirement. So, um, and then I can listen and while I continue to get ready to go. Um, first of all, just sort of maybe a shallow thing, but I can't help but notice that we're discussing this on the eve of Valentine's Day, <laughs> uh, the projections there. And um, there's so many things that, came to mind and but I think the most important thing is what how I um, was able to withdraw my proje projections on my husband uh, was that first of all I wrote the novel that I was talking to you about and it helped me to not having a Jungian analyst to give me the language to do this but it sort of came from this vision I had, but, and that recognizing that, that um, the, the, the object of the desire is really the self within. And, uh, and then, then also recognizing that self and the other. And so it brings me to mind, of course, we, you've all given some examples and I'll just throw another one in there. And it's like in, uh, in India and in East in the uh, Vedanta or Hinduism that, you know, we recognize the Atman uh, in each of ourselves and that it's all a part of Brahman, which is we can recognize by the Namaste I recognize the God in you and as, as the other person can through that um, gesture can express that. Um, there's so many other things that I thought about when we were discussing this, um, when everyone was discussing it. And something that Tim said that I wanted to talk about, but it's escaping me at the moment. But, you know, it's how to, and, I, and what you said, Angelique, is withdrawing. So also I wanted to say that you really, um, your presentation really gave me an under, better understanding of the tragedy, Greek, Greek tragedy, and how the, um, Daemon or the God, you know, the, the archetype can be either negative or positive. And that if you, you have, to, I think that uh, Jung said so, that you have to see it as uh, uh, separate yourself from it 
so you can have a dialogue with it. And uh, because it doesn't matter to that force whether what happens to you really. So you have to protect yourself and you do have to uh, withdraw the projection, but integrate the message. Um, and so uh, I, I'm, and then I was going to say, talk about what um, Tim said, so that if you can realize that and rebuild the relationship on meaning, uh, then you can integrate and, you know, have a be successful in doing that. But, you know, and I think we go round and round and, you know, hopefully if we are strong enough that we can um, come back to who to um, not being overwhelmed by it, but uh, going forward with it. And it may happen again and we do it again and again. And that seems to be our role as human beings to bring that to consciousness. Um, so sort of what I think you were talking about, Gary, in your paper and what we're working on as a group together here. So I will um, just stop now and listen to the rest of you. Thank you. Well said. Uh, Azim, would you like to uh, go next? Yes, uh, sorry I was late. I had issues uh, logging in. But um, um, I think, I don't know if you guys talked about this uh, at the beginning of the meeting, but what I heard here is more, um, looks like we are more fascinated with the positive uh, projection. And um, you really want to, be connected to the divine, see the divinity in us and stuff. Um, it's good because that's the only projection is the only way that we can see them, can have a glimpse of the animal animals. They're so deep in our conscious. So it's good in a way. Um, the problem is that the positive projection is gonna end. And um, it's not just about divinity, uh, it's also about demons. So in deep psychology, you're as interested in divinity as uh, in dem demons. And demons are actually the ones that teach us because uh, they're the dark side. It's fascinating how that love an admiration can turn into hatred. And um, all this negative projection that happens, if you're not aware, if you're not conscious, you're gonna project all your negative aspects onto that poor person. Um, so it's brutal both sides. Um, projecting a God onto a human is brutal. And projecting demons on this poor person is also um, brutal. So um, about the withdrawal of the projection, um, I think projection, positive projection is destined to um, fall apart. You don't really don't do anything to destroy it. And by withdrawal, we are not, uh, it's not about um, taking the aspects of pos pro positive projection and killing the positive pro projection. If we do it well, there's also, there's always a counterpart in that person. So if that person is really hardworking and I start working harder and take my work more seriously, there is something happening with him too, if the projection is two-sided, he will be inspired to do something new. He will be, he will find aspects in himself that um, he hadn't been able to do that before. 
So withdrawal um, is not taking the projection, it's ownership of these um, features. And if we do it well, it's gonna escalate, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna be more and more um, into practicality and into the physicality of the relationship. With um, negative projection, it's really hard because it's painful, it's really painful. And um, I think what you withdraw, if you were aware in the face phase of positive projection, at least you have something to tell yourself, okay, I turned some um, metal to gold here. I'm hard, more hardworking. I have this book written. Uh, I'm more disciplined. Um, I have found my voice as a woman. And this person also, he has some gold. Um, so that's good. But if you haven't withdraw anything, uh, it's just loss, just painful loss. And um, you have seen something, you have a glimpse of divinity, but you cannot sustain that image is taken away from you. And it is that person that took it away from you, that took that divinity from you. So you, we put a lot of blame on that person. How dare you leave me in that situation with nothing? Show me godly uh, uh, things and then disappearing and showing me demons. So it's really important to focus on um, the negative projection, I think, and work on the negative projection because these demons, they also have things to teach us. Um, we will see a lot of negativity uh, that is ours. We have to uh, have the ownership to them as well. And I think um, uh, last thing I want to say um, is that our task as human, I don't, I don't use the word purpose is too predetermined for me, uh, function maybe, uh, something we choose to be, I don't know. But by nature, as Jung says, what we do, our function is bringing unconscious to conscious. Our function is not finding, finding divinity and be stunned and just like smile at this and nothing happens. So um, I think this part of bringing unconscious to conscious happens in both positive, positive and negative um, phase of the projection. Um, and it's through the, the withdrawing process. Great, thank you. Uh, that was that was very interesting. Kat, would you like to go next? Um, thank you, Angelique, for a um, um, really great workshop. Um, I, I've got lots of thoughts, but I'll be brief. But I, I did um, think of when we're talking about projections is predominantly um, like a zine, the, the the negative projections. When I think of the projections of like the scapegoat or the, you know, or um, the projections from like sort of Nazi Germany or slavery and things like that, it's kind of like those are things that, you know, we don't often sort of talk about in, um, you know, when we're thinking about sort of godly kind of things. But I was also thinking about the projection of, you know, talking about um, love and things like that. But then also, again, in war, you have the projection of Venus with, like, rape situations and things in war. Um, what that does, how it f feels for me, I mean, I don't subscribe or I'm going to pretend to understand that I haven't read any of I haven't read much of Jung and everything else. So I'm not an analyst or anything like that. But in terms of my dreams, I looked. I I was remembering some dreams that I had where um, I I saw a goat hanging up on barbed wire, and one of the tasks I had to do was to save this goat. 
and then it, I freed it, and then there was a, a guy with really big, strong arms, but he was some kind of smithy kind of thing. And I, I did, uh, it did feel like a big dream. I had been in the presence of something quite powerful, if you see what I mean. And I can only go by my dreams in, 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 in that respect. But also when I think of paying allegiance to these things or being host to these things, I, I think of, like in like through paganism things like that people willingly taking on and dedicating themselves to gods and things like that and how that has an effect on their life when they start playing out the god myths so it, it, I, you have to be kind of careful but i i, I thank you for bringing this uh, and talking to us about this because this is something i find very interesting but um for myself i'm kind of like there's lots of questions I want to ask, and there's what lots trying to percolate in me. Um, but uh, no, thank you. And that, that's just what I want to say. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. Sorry, if I can say in 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 uh, in in the Greek myths, um, a divinity is can very well at the same time be a demon or a daemon. Mm. So the potential is there for both. Um, there is, they don't have a positive or a negative in them. They can be all and both. Um, this is why we can see gods in the Homeric, you know, in the Homeric narratives to turn from very evil to very kind uh, or choose one mortal that they favor and then destroy completely another. So there is a switch that helps us take a glimpse of the projection and its spontaneous um, expression. Um, Athena loves um, um, Odysseus, but she, she, she can be disastrous to others uh, in the Iliad. And, and it's okay, because these demon demon qualities are very, they are not set. They don't have a certain limit. They are constantly pervaded, constantly challenged, constantly constantly negated. Uh, and I wanted, I meant to say to Azim, there is this um, Buddhist practice in which you, they, well, thousands of years ago, they used to practice on tombs uh, where you call your demons and you invite them and you offer them your own body in pieces. So there is a visualization of your own dismemberment and you feed those demons with your own body. So there's a lot of Dionysus in it from my reading, but at the same time, there is a way to severe because the actual name in Tibetan of this practice is chod, severing severing the projection in which you offer your own pieces yourself your own pieces of the self you know the broken part of you in order to receive back wholeness in this enandiodromia that Hesiod talked to and Jung so marvelously incorporated in his work enandiodromia is when one action is being done this direction and nature will always reverse it as a response, Hesiod was the one who introduced it. So in this enandiodromic, if you like, um, ritual, very, very sacred and very, very secret, you can't very easily be um, initiated in that. You know, you offer the body uh, to the demons as their food, and as a result, they turn to demons. So there is not a set quality in the divinity. It can fluctuate between daemon, a positive projection, to demon, a very negative and disastrous one, to a very extremely kind and positive. There is no set. So that's that's enough. Yeah. Everything. Something very short. Uh, um, Jung doesn't suggest that. Jung warns us. Um, we should never dive into unconscious. First of all, the libido, the life 
force is coming, the flow is coming from um, psychoid to unconscious, to collective unconscious and then to the surface. So we will be diving against the flow. And then um, I've said that to many people and they try it, uh, they just dive into unconscious. It's very dangerous. Um, I think projections happen, but what I understand what you say about being conscious about this thing, the same thing that can be demon and diamond. So if we feel the diamond, we have to make a channel for its energy. Otherwise it will turn to a demon. But um, I think um, Jung didn't um, suggest uh, calling the demon. Could we hear from Camilla and Dahlia and Ava and uh, Carlos? Uh, just sorry, we don't have much time, but let's hear from each one of them. Uh, Dahlia, you want to go first? Yeah, OK. So thank you very much for the presentation. Really enjoyed it and loved it very much. And uh, had so many associations I'll have to work through, like, and um, okay, I'll share just maybe one or, or two. And um, when you mentioned also about erotic projection and like when von Franz was talking about Aphrodite and like when um, mm, like a change um, from Puella to the major woman capable of loving God and I don't know this passage, but I was wondering, does it speak about like Maria Magdalena and Jesus or is it? Yes, no, so I was... it's no, uh, it's um, it's um, Louis von Franz taking on Apuleius um, and the story of Eros and Psyche. I was referring to uh, Apuleius story of uh, Eros and Psyche in the metamorphosis of Apuleius. Marie uh, Louise von Franz um, has um, uh, presented the uh, has has talked about it. Has uh, dis is discussing in one of her books, the Eros and Psyche, I think. Um, but another Jungian has done that. Um, but this is part of Apuleius Metamorphosis, a Latin writer. And that's where you will find the story of Eros and Psyche, where Aphrodite asks um, Psyche to do a number of tasks. I can, I can find the story in uh, email to people. Um, and then she's asked to separate the chaff from the seed, which is what we talked about um, really today. Um, but I can definitely send that. Um, yes, and uh, actually, both the Apuleius uh, book and the one by Eric Neumann on er uh, Amor and Psyche, too. Uh, I'll put those in the send them out. Cool, thank you. And I also love the, um, I think there was like, I think Craig was saying, like, it's you cannot take the projection also literally, like. Uh, the same like dreams you cannot take dreams literally and it was like oh that's a clearer position how to handle or, or look at this for me so I think that's it thank you uh, Eva or Camilla either one hello this is Camilla uh, I just want to say thank you to Angelic for a wonderful presentation. Um, but otherwise, I, I don't have a lot to say today. Thank you. Eva, do you have anything for us? No, I have, haven't got anything more to say. Okay. Uh, Carlos, you're the last one. You have the final say. No, thank you. A great presentation. Yeah, I, I just want to thank uh, Angelique. That was, I will never think of projection at, because I was taking it so at, at a, such a low level. And now I realize that it's, it, it is incredibly divine. And I like to hear sometime you flesh out uh, uh, Martin Buber's uh, 
uh, explanation of it as well. Well, next time we'll start on, and I agree with Aline, the three most exciting chapters of the book. And uh, I think we're gonna learn a, a lot about uh, things I did not know before. So anyway, oh. thank you so much, Angelique and Sorry, everyone. Greg, um, yes. if I can say, I found this passage you asked me from uh, Tony Wolf. Yes, it's in the black books, volume one and it's page 96 and it seems that this is tony wolf's saying tony but Wolf's, I only yeah, it sounded it. so it's volume one uh page 96 of the black books and that's her words and it's september the 13th 1925 that she noted on her relationship um, it was a beautiful me. i had never heard her talk that way about it before and it was it's just lovely i'll tell you one little thing it's going to be in the protocols uh Young was going to break off relationship with her, but he had a dream that the uh, elves were go were uh, carrying her while singing into inside of a mountain, and she would be imprisoned inside the mountain forever if he did if he broke off the relationship with her, and yes. so that's why he didn't break off the relationship. But, but also he had the dream which made him decide whether he was to start a relationship. And that was of yes. the white bird. Yes, uh, uh, the white bird that white uh, bird. that says uh, says that I can only uh, come when, the, uh, when the, the male dove is busy with the 12 dead. <laughs> which yes. was- uh, Yes, and was you very, took very, this, uh, He took, he took this as a sign to, to take care yes. but i think he 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 really she really expected different things oh yes yeah especially at the end but you know young was very i don't know i can't say they're human beings you know yes. and like they Ava's, are not divine they are right. not they they're are not, not divine gods. no so <laughs> yeah we're all human. We, are. we all do this stuff kind of stuff well uh thank you everyone and we'll see you next time angelique again I'm so, I'm so grateful. That was so beautiful. Thank okay. you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Bye, all. Bye, all. Bye everybody.